We were talking about structural relations. We started talking about case as well. And uh, we are going to look at it. That is, what is case? And how do we understand them configurationally? That is, in the whole scheme of X bar, uh, how do we understand case? And how does X bar scheme help us uh, assignment of cases to different uh, NPs? See, the, the point is, any noun phrase in a sentence that you see, whether it is a subject noun phrase or an object noun phrase or anything else, a noun phrase within a PP which may be an adjunct. Okay? Uh, each noun phrase must have a case. If a noun phrase does not have a case, then the sentence is not grammatical. Okay? Also, if the noun phrase has a wrong case, still the sentence is grammatical. And I am going to show you some such examples. Remember this part? Uh, dominance and precedence so far. Keeping these two things in mind, we are going to move ahead with cases and we will introduce two more concepts of governance, that is government and then finally, C command, which I told you last time, the term stands for constituent command, how one constituent commands, controls the other one. Okay. Uh, we come to agreement patterns little later. Let us look at first case. Uh, first, first, we want to see the distinction between morphological case and abstract case. If you try to, if you understand what we mean by abstract case, then you understand what, what is the meaning of morphological case and vice versa. These two terms simply mean in a term, in a, in an NP, in a noun phrase, which has abstract case on it, we do not see the case. See the point? We do not see the case. In a morphological case, we realize that something has happened to that NP and therefore, it looks different. Okay? For example, look at the first sentence, John is from Germany. What are the noun phrases that you see here? John is one and Germany is the other one. The first thing that I told you is both the NP must have case. We do not know which case uh, so far, but both the NPs must have case. And as a matter of, I have, I have marked just the first one for our purpose, but both of them have abstract cases. Do you see any change in Germany? The, the, by change, I mean any change in the world. No. It comes as it is anywhere else. Okay? In whatever position it comes, whether in a subject position or an object position, the word comes exactly this way. Therefore, you see no change. Do you see any change in the name of the, any, any change in John? No. And, and again, I will make it clearer to you uh, what I mean by change. Okay? Now, look at the second one. We, we say his coat is big. Can we say he coat is big? No. Why not? Why do we need to say his? And what is possessive? You are right. That that is the possessive. And possessive is a case. Okay? So, the NP in a possessive case must be in a different form than nominative cases. John is in nominative case. Okay? 
his is a possessive case. Now look at the look at the, the next sentence. Mary is his friend. Mary is nominative case. What's about the other NP? That's a possessive case. So we cannot say Mary is he friend. Okay, and finally, uh, the sentence, the last sentence. I'm trying to use both pronouns in this sentence. He likes her. Now, the pronoun he, and look at the pronoun her. Can we say he likes she? No. Can we say his likes her? None of these things are allowed in English. The reason being, he is a nominative case. He is the form in the nominative case and her is the form in possessive case. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. So, in, in a set of four, four, five sentences, what I want you to see is there are some NPs which are in nominative cases, some NPs in other cases. At the same time, these are the examples of morpholo morphologically case marked NPs as well as abstract, as well as NPs with abstract cases, such as NPs like John, Mary, and he. These three NPs have abstract cases on them. That is, we do not see any change on them. However, when you see his and her, these are morphologically case marked NPs. Is this distinction clear to, to you? In the, disting the distinction that I want you to be clear with is morphological case and abstract case. See, keep in mind that each NP must have a case. So that is out of a question. That there will be an NP in a sentence which may not have a case is out of question. What is important is whether an NP has a morphological case on it or it's, it has an abstract case on it, that is the only distinction we have to make. I am going, I'm, I'm going to talk more about that. But you are telling the rule that everyone should have every Yeah, first I am telling you that every NP must have a case. Okay? And second thing I am telling you that some NPs will have cases, will have morphologically marked cases and some NPs will have abstract cases. What I mean by case is case is an abstract property of nouns, of, of noun phrases. Okay? These things are and it is also a property of a sentence. Okay. Cases are not properties of nouns in isolation. They receive a case only when they are in a, in a sentence. Therefore, a noun phrase to begin with does not have any case. Okay. It receives either a nominative case or an accusative case only when they appear in a different position in different positions in a sentence. So, case is an abstract property of sentence, number one. These, ca these cases are realized only on noun phrases. Okay? And these cases are, uh, how, how these cases are given to different NP NPs is what we are going to see further. Is this, is this making sense to you? Now, once again, let us, let us clarify this thing. We are going to repeat this again. We are going to see these things time and, time and again. But I am glad you asked, which gives me an opportunity to clarify this thing. Case is a prop, property of sentence. Though they are realized on noun phrases, noun phrases do not come loaded with cases. Okay? they receive cases within the sentence. Now, at this point, I do not want to take you to advanced debates 
there are some debates available in principles and parameters uh, and, and they are highly abstract and theoretical in nature where people argue or, or people have argued that noun phrases come with cases and then they unpack themselves in the sentence. Now, these are two abstract thing for us to, to see at this stage. Okay? Uh, what their argument is, just like a noun, a noun is either masculine or feminine. Right, right? The gender is not real, gender of a noun is not realized in a sentence. A gender of a noun is available with noun even without a sentence. For example, when I say chair, what is the, what's the word for chair in Hindi? Kursi. And I am giving you a Hindi example, it is going to be true in many other languages except English. Kursi, you put it outside a sentence or you try to use in a sentence. In both the cases, it has a gender which is feminine gender. So, the argument is just like a noun phrase, a noun has gender outside the sentence also. And lot of times it gets realized only in a sentence. Similarly, cases also come, noun phrases come loaded with case and they are realized in the sentence. See the, see the argument? Now, that argument is not relevant at this point. How, therefore, I want you to take only one part of that argument, which is case is an abstract property of a sentence, not, not of a noun phrase. Case is an abstract property of a sentence. In a sentence, when cases get, cases get manifested, they get manifested on noun phrases, okay? on noun phrases. How they get manifested in noun phrases is what I am going to show you little later. But Some examples of cases are nominative, objective, possessive and, and I am going to show you few, few more examples. Okay? These are some examples of cases. The third point I want you to know, some of them are going to show up in abstract form and some of them show up morphologically marked and this is what I am trying to show you here. Is this much? clear so far? Any, any hesitation, any problem, let me know. Or, or when we move and still you see some, some something contradicting one, each, one another, please remind me. And if, and if, they, uh, if they are not going through, if they, if they are not convincing, let me know. Okay? Now, look at the last sentence, John killed the tiger. See this thing? What are the two NPs in this sentence? John and the tiger. If I ask you, what kinds of cases given the two here do you see on these two noun phrases? I am not asking the names of the cases. I am asking, given the two things, what type of cases do you see here on, on these two noun phrases? Abstract cases, right? Once again, to wind this, wind up this discussion on abstract case and morphological case, what we mean is knowing that case is the property of a sentence, the two NPs in this sentence have two cases, namely one, what is the position of John? Grammatical position, subject position and the position of the tiger? Object position, very nice. So, John gets a, case, gets a nominative case in the subject position and again how I am going to show you in a minute, just let us take it for a moment. John gets a nominative case in the subject position and the tiger gets objective case or because it is an object, it, the case is called objective case or there is another name for the same, same thing which is accusative case, objective or accusative case because it is in the object position. Okay? However, 
you, you see no change in the, no physical change in these two words. This is the meaning of abstract case, that even though it has accusative case on it, that is the NP, the tiger, and even if the NP, John, has nominative case on it, we see no change as such in their physical form. Yeah, go ahead. Give an example where there is a physical change in the objective case. Yes, yeah. the, the sentence before. Yeah, so what exactly is a change that has happened? I am going, uh, hold on, let us look at this, this chart. We see, we see lot of changes in pronouns. Most of the time you are not going to see changes in nouns. However, you are going to see changes in, in pronouns and look at the, look at the changes. If you have a, if you have a lexical I, I NP, that, that is what I mean, mean when I said the distinction between noun and pronoun. Nouns are lexical NPs. If you have a NP like John, it is going to be the same in nominative case or accusative case. Okay? However, if you have pronouns, that is pronominal NP, in a, in a nominative case, you have I, in the accusative case, it is going to become me. Okay? In a, if you have he, in a nominative case, it is going to be he, in accusative case, it is going to become him. Okay? Or if it is she, in accusative case, it is become, it is going to become her. Okay? Now, see the, in the previous, previous slide, when we say he likes her, right? The fact that we cannot say he likes she, okay? The reason behind that is she has nominative case on it, okay? And when it appears in a object position, where it receives accusative case or objective case, it cannot retain its nominative form. It must appear in the accusative form. Okay? <laughs> now, this change in the form is visible on pronouns. That is what we mean by morphological marking. So, the change is from the nominative case. There are two, two forms. Okay? We, what we can say in an, in an abstract way, we have just one form, she. In a nominative case, the form is she. In accusative case, the form is her. We have one form, he. In nominative case, the form is he. In accusative case, the form is him. Okay? This is the distinction between uh, morphologic abstract case and morphological case. And the point that I, the further point that I am trying to make is he has abstract case because we do not see any change on it. We, because even though it, it has nominative case on it, we do not see any change. But the moment it takes accusative case, we see a change in it. It does not retain its form. What, be, what happens is the form becomes him. That is the meaning of morphological case. However, that is not true for lexical NPs like John or Mary. Right? Now, take the same sentence. If I want to say John likes Mary, John has which case? In the, in the subject position, nominative case and Mary has which case? Being in the object position, objective case or accusative case. Right? But do you see any change in the physical form of the word Mary? No. That does not mean it is nominative case. It is an accusative case because of its position in a sentence. Now, lexical NPs, the, here is the point, lexical NPs do not change their form even when they have different cases on them. That is called abstract case. Well, in the genitive, the situation will be different, absolutely right. But I am trying to hold on to just two, nominative and accusative, to see the distinction. However, in nominative positions, most of them are abstract cases. In accusative case, also, some 
some pronouns also. You can see the examples, I am not, not articulating them. For example, when you have you, no change even in accusative case. Uh, what else? It, no change in the accusative case. Uh, yeah, you and it at least. Uh, in the in genitive case, you see all of them changing. So, all the forms of genitive case are called NPs morphologically marked. That is some kind, by morphological case, we simply mean some change. Okay? Nominative cases, you are not going to see any change. Accusative case, sometimes the form change, forms change, sometimes forms do not change. That is all is the distinction between morphological and abstract cases. Are we okay so far? Okay? All right. Uh, now, we want to see if we have a sentence, okay, fine. He likes her, we can at least see something. He, if I tell you, he is a nominative case and her, her is accusative case. You have some evidence to believe it, right? Some evidence to believe that he has nominative case and her has accusative case. Even on the basis of this chart, you have some evidence to believe it. But when we have sentences like, John likes Mary, what is the evidence that other than what is the evidence that John has nominative case and Mary has accusative case other than the fact that someone is telling you so, telling you so, right? Other than the fact that we know that one is in the subject position and the other is in the object position. How do we know? And then the second question is, how do they get, is, is there, is the structure, the X bar scheme that we have seen? Does that have anything to do with case or we can put the same question in a better way as follows. Does X bar theory, X bar scheme help us understand nominative and accusative case or we just have to, uh, we just have to believe that one has nominative case and the other has accusative case. See the, see the question? The, the answer is, X bar scheme definitely helps us understand cases in a better way. So, we are going to see that. Uh, look at the, look at the examples here on this uh, screen. First, I want you to understand what we mean by a finite clause. Okay? For example, things like John likes Mary or John likes her, these are finite clauses. Finite clauses simply means that in a, in a X bar scheme, in an X bar scheme, uh, let us say we are talking about an IP. All right. This is where we are going to have objects and this is where we are going to have subjects in, in X bar scheme. If this IP has something in it like, if it is plus tense, do you understand the meaning of plus tense? No. If the sentence has a tense, this is the place where it is going to show up. So, as long as you have any tense coming up here, present, past, future, anything, then we say the sentence is plus tense. That is, sentence has tense. Then the whole clause is finite clause. If this has no tense, that is minus tense, then the sentence is non-finite. Then the sentence is non-finite. Very simple. Finiteness directly corresponds to tense. The moment we say a finite clause, 
or a finite sentence, we mean a sentence with tense. The moment we say non-finite clause, we mean a sentence with sentence without tense. That's all. Clear? So, if I say John likes Mary, is this a finite clause or a non-finite clause? John likes Mary, finite clause. John likes her, finite clause. I am, I, I, I know what, what is coming to your mind is, what is an example of a non-finite clause I am going to show you as you can see on the screen, but hold on before we go there. Now, look at the, look at the sentence in red, which is not grammatical. With a star marks, we mean ungrammatical sentence. What is the meaning of that? So, I am sorry, why is that, why is that ungrammatical when we say John likes she? What is the, what is? She is an object position and the pronominal NP is not displaying its objective form. It is displaying its nominative form is the reason why this sentence is ungrammatical. Okay? Now, we are going to use this finiteness, the distinction between finite and infinite very soon to see why we need this discussion. Let us let us look at non-finite things. You see the, uh, see the whole sentence for, John, for him to go to Delhi is not possible. Okay? Are you with me? For him to go to Delhi is not possible. Is this a good sentence? The whole sentence? Good or not? Good sentence? It is perfectly good sentence. Now, whole sentence is a finite sentence. The whole sentence, whole big sentence is a finite sentence because it has tense in it. And what is the tense in the whole sentence? Present tense, I, I, I hope I am not asking you too complicated a question. For him to go to Delhi is not possible and what shows us present tense in this sentence? Is. Clear? Now, next question and I am asking you these questions to make sure that you understand these terms. Next question, what is the subject of this sentence? What is the subject of this sentence? Please do not think about x bar and other things right now. Very simply, uh, in simple terms, the question is, what is the subject of this sentence? Him? Why? Sorry? Him is the sentence because? Before the verb go. Goes, go. Now, we are talking about a completely different thing now, right? We are saying, what is the, what is the, what is the verb in the full sentence? You see, this is a pretty simple sentence, pretty simple looking sentence. And I am not sure if I have told you this thing, for sure, I have not discussed these things with you. I am only starting to discuss, okay? I mean, there is, there is one more type of sentence where I can show you non-finiteness, but I have already discussed that sentence enough. For example, imperative sentences are non-finite sentences. When we say, please go home, please sit down, these sentences are infinite sentences. But I wanted to take one more sentence, slightly bigger, to show you infiniteness. And the reason here, and, and the, the answer to this finite and infinite sentence is the following. And, and listen to me carefully looking at the sentence. The whole sentence for him to go to Delhi is not possible is a finite sentence. The tense in this sentence is present. Therefore, this sentence is, non -fin is finite. Agreed? Everybody? The, the chunk that you see in red, the whole thing for him to go to Delhi is the subject of this sentence. For him to go to Delhi is the subject of this sentence, whole sentence. 
that is in the IP in the spec IP position in the spec IP position what comes is the whole thing in the red bracket you see that because the sentence is just like John is my friend right in the sentence John is my friend the subject is the subject is John whatever comes before is is the subject in this sentence whatever comes before is is the whole clause and the whole clause is the is the subject now in the whole clause the whole clause what is the verb we are we are calling it a clause right the whole clause is the subject what is the verb in this clause you were right somebody said to go right is the verb now what is the NP in that clause him right I am, I, am, I am trying to complicate the questions for you to see these, see the concepts in a better way. And here is the complication. The, this clause seems to have a subject and seems to have a verb, right? Then it, this, this clause should be a sentence. But what is missing from this clause to be a sentence? What agreement. is sorry? Is it agreement? Agreement is missing. All the possible ingredients that make a subject, that make a sentence, is missing from this. What is the tense in that clause? No tense. Because the moment you have a tense, we cannot say to go. Okay? Is is out of question. We can't say to go. So there is no agreement and no tense. Therefore, that clause is a non-finite non clause. You see that? that therefore, that clause is a non-finite clause. Do we see the distinction between a finite clause and non-finite clause now? A finite clause is a, is a clause or a sentence with tense. A non-finite clause is a clause or a sentence without tense. And when you have no tense, then there is no agreement. Are you with me? No tense, no agreement. Can I, can I take you for, for less than 30 seconds to another question for you to see it right, right now? Because I am making a point which will help you understand something which we have already discussed. Remember, when we had broken the IP, the I, there, are, there were three things in I, which were agreement. tense, agreement and aspect. We had a question in mind at that time, right? that how do we order them? How do we start? Do we start with tense? Do we start with agreement? We decided that, okay, aspect is dependent on tense. So, let us put aspect and tense together. Do we start with tense or agreement? We started with agreement and then we did not settle the question there that which one is logically first. By first we mean logically more prominent, more significant. Now, you can have agreement, you can have tense or you cannot have tense, right? But the moment you do not have tense, you do not have agreement also. So, which one is more important, tense or agreement? You see, the, you see the point? Therefore, starting the structure with TP is more logically convincing than starting the structure with agreement. You see, see this thing? That is all I wanted to show you at this point. So, in a sentence like this, in a clause like this, you have no agreement and no tense. The moment we have no tense, we do not even need to look at agreement. We can simply say this is a non-finite class, end of the story. So, right now, I am only trying to show you finite clauses and non-finite clauses. I promise you, I will come back to this again and we will discuss little bit more. 
I am not going to leave this thing just like that. For example, when I am saying, for him to go to Delhi, the whole thing is a, is a clause, right? Uh, and the whole thing is the subject. I am going to show you more examples to make a point that subject position does not only need an NP. We can have a clause or a bigger sentence or a much bigger sentence in subject positions. Remember, from the very beginning I have been trying to tell you that the whole notion of subject is a very complicated notion. It is not easy for anyone to define and say in one sentence, this is what is subject. We have tried to define a subject from the perspective of agreement, from the perspective of uh, semantics and still we see that it is not just an NP, it could be a bigger, bigger chunk also. It could be a, a, a non-finite clause, it could be a finite clause, it could be a CP. Have we, have we, we have discussed CP a little bit, right? We will come back to that again. So, it could be CP, it could be much bigger, bigger a clause or an NP. Same is the story for object position also. So, we are, we are going to see some examples of those things. I, I just want to give you a flavor right now and the, all I want you to take from here is finiteness and non-finiteness. Now, two more things before we go to a structure I want you to know. Nominative case is reserved for subject positions. Whatever comes in the subject position gets nominative case. How is, is, is something that we can see structurally and I am going to show you that. But the moment something comes in, an, in a subject position that gets nominative case. And accusative case or objective cases are for objects object positions. And by definition we know what are the types of verbs which can have objects? Transitive verbs or ditransitive verbs. Intransitive verbs do not have objects. So, so keep these things, these things in mind. What are the things other than verbs which can take an object? A, like a post position can take an object. When we say on the table, on the table, the post position on has the table as its object. Sorry, I am sorry, a preposition has, uh, you see the, there is another term I want to give you at this stage. Uh, I, I, I do not like throwing terms uh, only uh, so that you have to memorize them or you have to understand a lot of them. You understand the distinction between preposition and postpositions, do not you? You know, to combine the two, there is another term which is called add position. So, we use the term add position and depending on the language, we, we take them as preposition or postposition. Okay? But, but that is all right, you do not you don't have to remember the term. You are right, in this case, on the table, we are talking about a pre, preposition and preposition takes the object, the NP. We are going to see some of these things today. Now, here is how it, it, it works and I will show you structurally also. So, we have, a, we have a sentence, John plays football in the playground. Okay? The, the assumptions that we have made so far is John, nominative case. What is in the objective case or accusative case? Football. <laughs> Abstract case marker or morphological case marker? Abstract case marker. So, I am bringing this thing again, the abstract or morphological just is for us to understand. Whether abstract or morphological, it has a case. Okay? So, and then we have, what, what is the other NP that we have? The playground and the PP is in the playground. So, the question is, there are three NPs in this sentence. One is John, the other is football and the third is the playground. Each NP, that is all three of them must have cases. We need to explain how do they get cases? Who gives them cases? When the moment we say they must get case, we also must explain what gives them cases. 
And the moment we say, we, we, def, we determine what gives them cases, X bar scheme helps us understand how. Okay, so quickly, let's look at this. So, verbs and postpositions assign accusative cases. Verbs and postpositions assign accusative cases. In other words, what we, what we really want to say is, when we say uh, verbs and postpositions, we really mean heads. So, in a VP, what is the head of this VP? Verb. And uh, what is the head of a PP? Prepositions. So, when we say verbs and postpositions assign cases, assign accusative cases, what we mean is heads assign accusative cases to their complements. Heads assign accusative cases to their complements. That is what we mean when we say verbs and postpositions assign accusative cases to the NPs, they govern and see command. Now, we are bringing in the two terms govern and see command, right? And I am going to explain that to you. And, okay, we answer the last question, what assigns case to the subject little later, okay? Let us first look at verbs and uh, post position uh, and, uh, and prepositions. And before that, we need to look at the notion of uh, C comma, government and C command. We are trying to say, look at all the structures that, that are in front of you and try and understand the notion of government. Go, notion of government first and then the notion of C command. Not very complicated, these are the new terms. Probably you are listening to these terms for the first time. Am I, am I right? Can I? In, the advantage in this class is I can make these assumptions very simply. Uh, very simple. I can't make any assumptions about physics, chemistry and all kinds of engineering in terms of how much of those things you know or you may have heard before, but about these things I can make simple assumptions. Am I right? And this is not to show you that you do not know these things. I, the, all I am trying to assure you, in fact, I, what I am trying to assure you that even if you are listening to these terms for the first time are not very complicated terms. They are simpler notions. Look at this. Did you take a look at this? It means, it says A governs B if and only if A is a governor. By governor, we simply mean heads. Only heads are governors and A C commands B. These two conditions must be fulfilled for a head to govern another, another node. Okay? The node A governs node B if and only if A is a governor, which is A must be a head and A C commands B. Then A is a governor. So, when we said, hold on before we come to C command again. So, when we said verbs and post positions are governors, we are also saying verbs and post positions must be head, heads which they are and they can assign cases only when they are in the head position. Again, I want to underline the notion that I have told you that it is a, it's a, it's a property of a sentence. Case is a syntactic property, verbs outside a sentence cannot do anything. A verb becomes a head only when it is part of VP, okay? So, so keep, keep these things in mind. And the verbs assign accusative case only to the, to the NP that they govern, right? So, they must be a governor, that is they must be a head and they must see command. How do they see command? A C commands B if and only if A does not dominate B, okay? And 
the first branching node dominating A also dominates B. Is that true? The first branching node dominating A also dominates B. And here, if the term is not clear, if the term first branching node is not clear, what we mean is this. What is the first branching node here? This is the node which is branching. Okay? However, okay, so let us first understand this thing. First branching node dominating A, does it dominate B? Yes. Someone can extend this thing and say, look, this node okay, also dominates both of them. Is that true? But this, no, this node dominates both of them, but this node is not first branching node dominating the two. This is at second or third or whatever branching node. The first branching node dominating the two is this one. This is why we are introducing the term first branching node dominating A also dominates B. Okay? This definition runs little bit into difficulty and then there are uh, uh, control mechanism applied to these things which I do not want to show you right now. I only want you to understand with clarity the two terms government and C command where case assignment simply means that the, when the verb assigns a ca case to the NP football. Okay. It assigns accusative case with the notion of government and C command, which means verb governs its complement, verb C commands its complement. You may be wondering why do we need to say govern and C command? Why can't we simply say verb assigns accusative case? Okay? The answer to this question I will show you little, little later. By, by little later, I do not think we are going to do it today. We are running out of time. But I will show you that, that thing. But hold on, let me, let me conclude this thing. Does this apply here too? In the, the, the post position is in and uh, what was the other NP? The playground. The complement of this P is the NP, the playground. And I am, I am assuming here that you understand that we are not talking about playground, we are talking about the entire NP. Okay? So this P is a governor, it governs this NP and it C commands this NP. Therefore, we say prepositions and prepositions and verbs are governors, they are heads and they assign accusative cases with the notion of government and C command. This is what I mean when I said X bar scheme helps us understand certain of these things. I am not skipping, I am leaving it behind. I had it on schedule. We thought we will be able to look at nominative case also, but we will look at nominative case tomorrow. It is important for us to understand. But before we go, let me just show you one more thing where we started. Do you see again this finite clause for him to go to Delhi? Do you see this thing? Sorry, non finite clause. What is for doing here? Can we not say him to go to Delhi? He to go to the, we are not saying he to go to Delhi. Do you see this thing? We, we, we use these kinds of sentences, but I am asking you to draw your attention to these sentences. And probably it will make more sense to you. What is him doing here? How did it get him? And where did it get accusative case from? Him is an accusative case, mark accusative case NP. Him, right? And who gave it accusative case? Even though it is non-finite sentence, him 
is the subject of that non-finite sentence. I will, I will show you these clauses threadbare to see these notions and I do not want to leave you guessing. For the time being, I can tell you the preposition for is giving accusative case to him. Okay? In the subject position, it is getting an accusative case. We cannot have just he, he there. And therefore, for a sentence like this, we must say for him to go to Delhi. We need to begin the sentences with, pre, with prepositions because if we do not have the preposition there, this NP remains uncase marked and therefore not a good, good sentence. We can say he to go to Delhi is impossible or not possible. We have to say for him to go to Delhi is not possible. More later, I do want you to understand this sentence and sentences like these when we have looked at more. Okay? Thank you.